for the quest. And for the buster. And for the slayer. There was only the dragon. Is this how it all began? To find out, let's play Dragon Egg. So this is Dragon and Princess, uh, released in 1982 for the Japanese PC-88 computer and a couple of other systems. This game was developed by uh, Koei, uh, at this time known as Koei Mycom. Uh, they are still around, still making games such as I believe the Dynasty Warrior series and probably a few others. I really don't know any beyond the fact that I have an Indo Way of the Ninja mounted on my wall right now. And it is notable for being known as the first role-playing game developed by a Japanese developer. There are a few other contenders for that specification. Uh, there is a lot of murkiness because a lot of these games didn't have well-defined release dates, and it's very difficult to define what a role-playing game is anyway, or even what a Japanese developer is. For various reasons, I think this one is as good a contender as any. Now, you will notice that this is a translation. Uh, the original, of course, was in Japanese. I had heard that the CRPG addict had a desire to play this game as part of chronicling the early history of Japanese role-playing games, but was having a lot of trouble with the language barrier, because obviously it is a lot harder to read Japanese than German if you know nothing about either. So I was inspired to take a quick look at it. It was not too hard to dump the bulk of the game's text into spreadsheets. Another commenter on the CRPG Addicts forums, uh, Laszlo Binyi, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, took care of going through those spreadsheets and translating much of that text, which reduced the amount of work I had to do myself, so I was able to get a reasonable version of this patch out to the CRPG addict, and he did eventually write a post about it on his blog, which I will link to in the video description. That's what you do for these things, right? Now, one good thing about this game is it was written in uh, NEC Basic, the dialect of Basic used by the PC-88 and similar computers. And the current emulator for that, M88, does have an option to view the original basic source code of NEC basic programs, which means, one, you can look at the algorithms for how the game mechanics work if you are so inclined. Two, it means you can see this block of comments at the top of the code, which sheds a little more light on the authorship of the game. Not much, but a little. Uh, one, you do see that the... Uh, version number is 1.3, implying that there were probably earlier versions of the game. That is supported by the fact that there are screenshots of this game with much less high-fidelity graphics in the combat system, either earlier versions for the PC-88 or another release that just didn't have the right graphics. No way to know as far as I know. Uh, we do see the two authors here, who are listed on the title screen as Y Hayase and Locke. Uh, the comments break it down a little more. Uh, y Hayase is credited with the scenario, probably what we would now call the game design. We can also see that the programming is credited to Locke and dated uh, October 1982. Whether that's the date that he or she finished writing the program, or the date when it was actually released commercially, there's no way to know. It is a date a bit more specific than the general December 82 date that I think the Japanese record sites more or less arbitrarily assigned to it. We also have another name, C. Sportif, credited for convert, whatever that is. Could be someone who converted it to PC-88 from one of the other PCs. Could be someone who set it up to run on this particular disk image. I do not know. 
this is, by the way, the only known dump of the game. It's on a collection disc with a number of other games on it, including such classics as Skirt Flip, uh, Momoko-chan's Cherry Grabbing Game, and The Pro Bowling. I guess that's about all there is to say about the game, so let's get started with our own playthrough here. You do have the option of choosing how wide you want the screen to be. The PC-88, I guess, supported both resolutions. It looks a bit better at 80, so I'm going to choose that, even though I'm aware of one display bug that may have been a result of my patch, I'm not sure. You can save to a tape drive, I think. I have not been able to get that to work myself, because the emulator doesn't seem to do a good job of making blank tapes, but theoretically it's possible. Now, you have your five pre-generated characters here. There's no way to actually roll a character beyond this. They have slightly different stats. Mainly just makes a difference when you're starting out in the game. But all you can really do with them is enter names. Uh, I will not be doing that, because if you enter no name at all, you get the default, possibly canonical names of these characters, which I've transcribed as Gombe, Jirosaku, Tarosaku, Yosaku and Goemon. I have no idea if those are a reference to anything at all. And the way this game basically plays is it's kind of a weird hybrid of a text adventure game and an Ultima game. It's mostly presented in text prose, but you have a limited set of keyboard commands, just as arcane as Ultima, but not quite so prolific by which you interact with the world. And we start out here talking to the king of this place who wants us to go fight some bandits and recover some treasure. So, as with most text adventure games, you can get slightly more descriptive text about an area by looking. You can try and find things by searching. You can, I guess, move around with the, well, they call it the 10 key on these old systems, but the numpad, we'd call it in, in the US. You can bump into walls all you like. Uh, most of these commands, of course, do nothing. You can also hurry, but I have no idea when or if that's ever useful. There's nothing to get here, but you can also get, or, or we could do that, I suppose. Apparently, get is kidnap the princess. But doing that does make the king sick his knights on you, and that is as good a way of any to point out how the combat system looks. This is also mildly notable for being one of the first, if not the very first, games that actually have a tactical map with multiple party members controllable by the user. Uh, Ultima 3, of course, made it a lot more famous a few months later, but this did predate Ultima 3 pretty clearly. But all you can really do in tactical combat is move around. All of your characters move exactly three steps no matter what, so having more speed or anything doesn't actually help you. Uh, all opponents in the game only move one at a time, so it's relatively easy to maneuver, maneuver around them. Uh, and that's really all you can do in combat. Once you get up close to something, you can attack it. Which is not going to happen for another round. And once it's up close to you, it can attack you. You can also pass around if you don't want to do anything, but unlike something like an Ultima game, it has no magic system or anything. But the knights here are meant to be an unwinnable battle. They are really powerful, especially for a starting party. And even if you did hack the game or l grind horribly and successfully beat this encounter, they just respawn indefinitely, as far as I know. So, let's not do that. Let's just leave the castle and start looking around. Now, if you... Now, I'll start this way. If you go north, you can't go anywhere. There is no way to know that other than trying, for the most part. If you go east, you end up somewhere else where you can't go anywhere. 
If you go south, you go through a couple of screens that takes you across a lake and into a large, mazy, and confusing forest area. There is absolutely nothing in that forest area. I would suggest don't even bother going there. It is an alternate route to destinations that you actually do care about, but it is far from the most straightforward way to get there, so don't even bother. Instead, where we actually do want to go is west. This is pretty obscure, but if you look around carefully, you look and then search, only if you do that combination you will find a sign there, which you can then read, and you get directions to another landmark. There are a handful of locations in the game that have such directions on them, and trying to figure out where you're going blind is pretty much dependent on stumbling around completely blindly, looking and searching in every tile until you happen to find such a thing, and eventually not finding where you're trying to go. I seem to have gone further than I intended. In many locations, if you go in a direction where you're not actually permitted to go, you get lost, which basically means that you walk in random directions for a random number of turns, which in this particular case was happily just one, and eventually it will put you back in some random known location. It is a pain. Try not to get lost, but if you're playing the game blindly, you probably can't avoid it. And because there are a lot of places just called Road, I have no idea which one it dumped me at. Okay, so just to show you how I would have gotten here if I hadn't gotten lost. From the castle, you go west 1, you find that sign that I just showed you. You go west, north, north, that takes you to this landmark, the Tea House. You can't actually go in with not a useful error message. If you look, you see that the tea house is closed. If you search, you will see that there are, for some reason, directions on the wall of the tea house. That takes us to our next landmark, which is west, west, north, north. This is Ross Blue Town. If you were leaving Ross Blue Town, by the way, you can search and find directions written on a table that will take you back to the tea house. But that is, for the time being, irrelevant to us. For now, let's just go into the town. Now, when you are navigating inside the town, there is a chance in every tile you enter that a pickpocket will be there. You won't actually see the pickpocket in any way until you check your inventory later. Ah, oh, when did that happen? Until you check your inventory later and see that one of your characters has no weapon. Hopefully you don't find that out in the middle of combat. So, to prevent that, every time you enter a square in the town, make sure you search. If there happens to be a pickpocket in the square you just entered, you will notice the pickpocket and you will not have anything stolen. Now, on this trip into the town, all I want to do is buy weapons for my characters especially the one who inexplicably has no weapon now. So, from the entrance to get to the weapon shop, you want to go... Well, I'll point out, if you look around, all the streets do have names. They kind of form a rough grid. If you get completely lost, it's not all that useful for navigation, especially if you go towards the center of town. Things get really twisty, but... It's something. But what I want to do is go north twice until I get to the corner here in the northeast side of town, and then go west once, and I find at Lucky East 2nd Street there is a weapon shop called Hayase. I just now realize that's named after the developer. Interesting. There's also a food shop in town called Lock, by the way. I'll probably be coming back there later, but for the time being I'm not going to worry about food. But we go into the weapon shop, we use the by command, we can get weapons. I would like to get a longsword for my lead character for now. I would like to get a longsword for character 3, who lost his weapon. And I would also like to get a longsword for character 4, who has terrible attack power without it. So let's look briefly at how the stats for this game actually work. 
you have your power, you have SP, probably speed, you have your hit percentage and your hit points, and an XP total. Power, as you might imagine, is how much damage you do in combat. Speed, if that's indeed what it is, seems to be basically your AC, how likely you are to avoid an attack. Uh, hit percentage is how likely you are to hit. Uh, it's not a direct percentage, it does seem to be modified by the speed of whatever you're attacking. Uh, the CRPG Addicts blog post describes it as being basically a type of FACO. Bonus points if you know what a FACO is. As far as I know, there's no reason to dispute that dis description. And your hit points is obviously your hit points. Your EXP you gain every time you do damage in combat. For each damage you do, you gain one EXP. There's a couple of other ways to gain and lose EXP, but they're not relevant at the moment, so I won't get into them. And when you buy weapons, which are the only equipment you can buy, all they really do is act as a multiplier on your power. Character 4, for example, would have had a base power of 5, which is terrible, but because I upgraded him from a short sword to a long sword, he is now at a doubled value of 10. And that's pretty much all we can do to upgrade our weapons. So, I'm going to leave, again, searching the whole way. Hopefully, if I'm lucky, I'll actually see a pickpocket on the way out, but no. You would see a message saying, watch out, there was a pickpocket if you had found one, but I didn't. So, again, just to demonstrate that I have my weapons now, let me point that out. I also start with some number of pieces of food. I don't remember how much, but I'm down to five now. That'll be plenty for the time being. But to get to where I next want to go, I'm not going to spend too much time wandering around. There are a few places off the map that have mildly interesting descriptions, but I'm not going to bother going to them because getting lost in this game is so easy and the encounter rate can get pretty terrible. But I go west once and I get into the hills. I then go straight south a few times through a few different places. And we hit a random encounter. I was kind of hoping that wouldn't happen, but here we are. One kind of cute thing you might notice in the combat screen, by the way, is that, one, your characters are color-coded, two, most of them have numbers on their shirts for your convenience in identifying them. So what we are fighting here is a couple of giant snakes. Uh, they happen to have a power of 6, a speed of 5, uh, their hit percentage is 80, and they have 20 HP. Now, something I do want to do is try to get as much experience for my protagonist, character number one, as I can. And since experience is gained by doing damage to monsters, that means I want to try and save as many hits on the monsters as I can for character number one. We will get to why that is later on. Sometimes, if you go through a round of combat, you see that message about the voice of God shouting at you to finish the combat. As far as I know, that's as good a translation of that line as any, but I think it just happens, and when a goat round goes through without any damage being inflicted on monsters, but I'm not totally sure on that, and I don't know if it has any meaningful in-game effect. So apart from trying to get my lead character to land damage as much as I can, I'm going to try to get... My other characters surrounding the en enemies so that as much damage is dealt to them instead of him as possible. Now, unfortunately, combat in this game takes bloody forever. 
So, we are going to be here for a while, and I am probably going to fast forward through most of this. Because most of combat pretty much entails getting in position, and then missing over and over and over. Especially when I'm trying to let no one except the lead character do damage, and the lead character has terrible starting hit chance. I think it would be a bit easier to hit them because they have such terrible speed. But my base hit chance is pretty atrocious. Okay, that was actually a pretty good hit. Excellent. I don't expect my other party members to catch up with that too quickly, so I'm going to be a bit less shy about having them deal damage now, I think. Damage in this game seems really unpredictable. I have not looked in detail at how the formula works, so I couldn't tell you offhand, but... Pretty often, you will be derping back and forth, dealing one or two damage at a time, and then suddenly you get a hit that rolls 20, 30, or more. That does mean that there's a pretty reasonable chance that if you run into the wrong enemy early in the game and it happens to get a lucky damage roll against you, you can die really, really quickly. Okay, that was our first combat. Just to look at how our XP is doing here. Uh, character 1 does still have the most XP, that's fine. So, where am I? Still at the plateau, I still want to continue going south. Eventually I get to this location, the bottom of the mountain. This is where I change my direction, this is also where I have to fight another combat. Hooray! This one happens to be with giant spiders, which, happily, are another one of the not-terribly-scary monsters. They have 6 attack power, 5 speed, uh, their hit percentage is 80, and they have 20 HP. In fact, I believe they are completely identical to the snakes we just fought, apart from the character sprite. So, same as before, I'm going to try to surround them. Gradually. If possible, prioritize my lead character if it becomes relevant. That's honestly about all there is to tactical combat in this game. That said, the fact that you're trying to spread out damage and the fact that you're trying to direct experience to your lead character makes it require at least a little bit more thought than most combats I've seen in the wilderness in, say, Ultima 4. That's right, I just favorably, favorably compared this game to Ultima 4. Fight me. Theoretically, we get better at combat over time, but not by very much. Combat is pretty much going to be endless for the remainder of the game. Uh, you do get a bit of gold when you kill monsters in combat. It doesn't really have that much use after you buy your initial swords, but it is there. Let's look briefly at our stats again. Now, the way advancement works is every 50 EXP your character gets, they get a little bit of a boost to their speed and hit, and hit percentage. Uh, they do not get a boost to their power, and I don't think your maximum HP ever increases. So, like you will see, that character 1 now has a 20 hit percentage instead of 15, which is slightly better than it used to be. Not that it's going to be doing him much good, but... But I think the gold that you get from fighting monsters is based on their power stat. I'm not absolutely sure on that. But... So, anyway, we come west from the bottom of the mountain, and we're coming up a mountain road. Keep going west until we reach this stone road. Can't actually go in any direction from here. Uh, 
Uh, if we look, we see some notes about stone slabs and god statues. I believe based on Laszlo's notes, those are like little Buddhist statues that are common in Japan or something. But by searching here, you get a useless message that you can go any direction, which you actually cannot. So to actually make any progress at all, you need to read, even though there is absolutely nothing suggesting that you might be able to read that stone slab. That will tell you that if you go west, you will reach the mountaintop. If you go south, you will reach the bandit hideout. I think as soon as you've read that once, you will continue to be able to take those directions for the remainder of the game, but until you read, you can't go anywhere from here. So, let's peek over at the mountaintop first. There is a hut here. We go in, and we meet a mountain monk. Uh, the term the original text uses is Sennin, which is like a Buddhist monk who lives as a hermit and has magic powers or something. I don't know all the myth mythological details, but it's more than just what we'd think of as a monk. I almost considered changing this to be a wizard, but it's not really supported. Whatever. There's a sword here, but of course we can't get it. The game laughs at us for even thinking we can try. Uh, what the monk tells us, most importantly, is that the bandits have a safe house in the town. So even if we go to that bandit hideout we just saw and clear that out, that's not all the bandits. We're going to have to go back to town and find that safe house later. But for the time being, we cannot get that sword. I wonder if it's meant for us to come back and get later. Nah, probably belongs to some other hero. Anyway, let's leave, go back over here, and head into the bandit's hideout. That immediately starts the encounter. So the bandit village here has a sort of unusual layout and a somewhat unique combat mechanic here. Uh, it has a lot more obstacles for one thing, so you can do a little more tactically here than you can do on most of the wilderness maps. Additionally, the houses you see there, you can search those and find the treasure that the bandit stole that we are supposed to be recovering. However, there is a random chance each round that those houses might burn down, taking the treasure with them. So in addition to trying to fight the bandits themselves, you are trying to rush to loot all the houses before they can be burned. Now, as before, I would like to prioritize experience for my lead character, so check where everyone is real quick. No one really has all that much. And number three, Tarosaku has 24. So I'll probably send Tarosaku and Goemon out, since they have probably the highest EXP right now. I'm going to have those two take care of looting the houses. While having the other characters try and back up the lead character in actually fighting the bandits. I think. We'll see how that actually works out tactically. But... Oh wow, a house already burned. Uh, I would not worry too much about trying to get all the treasure though because you only really need about 1,000-ish uh, from this encounter. You will be able to make up the difference in the 3,000 that the king asked you to get later. And some of the houses have named treasure items that have some enumerated value in gold. Additionally, any time you loot a house either way, you will get some amount of EXP for doing so. I believe it's something like either 1 25th or 1 50th of the value of the treasure. Something like that. 
and that is awarded to all party members, not just the one who did the looting. So you don't need to worry about having the lead character loot the houses, because the experience coming from looting the houses will go to all the characters equally. Oh wow, Goemon already got killed. It's not the biggest deal in the world when characters die, because just not there siphoning EXP from the main character anymore. The bandits you encounter in these scripted events, by the way, are different from the ones that you can potentially encounter in the wilderness. Uh, this particular type of bandit, which you can tell by the purple shirt as opposed to a red shirt, has 20 power, 15 speed, 30% hit chance, and uh, 25 hit points. So they're in some ways a little less difficult to kill than the wilderness ones, but it's good because there are so many of them this encounter. As it is, it is taking forever to get any damage on them. One good thing is as we loot these houses, we should accrue some EXP, which might gradually improve our combat effectiveness a little bit. Not by too much, I don't think, because you do not get much EXP from looting the houses. I do wish they gave you some visual indication of which houses have been looted. I guess keeping track of that is part of the challenge of the encounter. You'd just be glad, if you are watching this, that you are able to watch it in Fast Forward. Okay, that's some progress, finally. I don't really want Gombe to get surrounded there, because if he dies, the game actually does end. So your strategy basically has to entail having him avoid as much damage as possible while dealing as much damage as possible, which is a vaguely challenging trade-off. Happily, Gombe is getting some pretty good hits in in this combat, so... Hopefully he will manage to keep his EXP lead. Throw that one out, please. I am really not sure how clever the enemy movement algorithm is in this game. It doesn't seem like they move completely randomly, they usually do a pretty good job of coming up and engaging with you if you just leave them alone. Sometimes, even when I'm trying to lure them into a specific place, they just don't move. I guess I could look at the code and see how that works, but so far I have not. Okay, so that's all the bandits. As far as I know, that was all the treasure. I do have to skip turns until I finish out the round. And I do have the option to stay here and continue to loot the houses if I hadn't already. I could also come back into this area. There wouldn't be any more bandits, but I could still loot the houses if I had left treasure behind. But it's not really relevant, because if you're strategizing this properly, you've already prioritized clearing the houses before dealing with all the bandits. We are done there. Let us see how our EXP is after all that. Wow, we actually got a lot out of that, more than I thought we would. That's pretty impressive. I don't know if that was all from looting or what. But in any case, Gombe does still have slightly more EXP than everyone else. I just need to make sure not to disrupt that in any further combats. The main one I need to be concerned about is number three, Tarosaku, so I'll try to bear that in mind. Also, if I check my inventory... He actually did not get very much treasure out of there. Hmm. 
Well, we are going to see if the king complains if I don't come back with a full 3,000. By the way, I meant to mention this earlier, but the gold is denoted with that K suffix, which to an English spe speaker looks like they are denominating gold in units of a thousand. In other words, this is a dress worth 500,000 gold coins. I'm inclined to suspect that's probably not what they meant. Uh, gold in Japanese is kin, which would start with a K and might be abbreviated as that, in the same way that an English text might use G as an abbreviation for gold, maybe. Numerals in Japan usually don't go in units of a thousand, they go in units of ten thousand. On the other hand, Japan does use the metric system, I believe, so I don't really know. But my suspicion is it's probably not meant to be units of a thousand. K is just the currency, whether it's keen or something else. So, there's nothing else to do over there for now, so we're just going to go back down to the mountain the way we came. Now, if I go east from this southernmost plateau area, I actually end up in the desert here, which there is nothing of any interest in the desert, it's just an alternate route back. And I could from here go east through a bit more desert and I'd end up on the far side of that forest maze area that I mentioned earlier, but I'm not going to do that. It's not right, is it? How did I end up in the forest from there? That is not what I meant to do at all. Well, now you get to see me try to navigate my way out of the forest blindly. Oh, interesting. That's another random thing that can sometimes happen in place of encounters. I don't see it all that often when I'm actually looking for it. But you will occasionally see this medicine girl pop into existence. Contrary to expectation, you would not buy the medicine from her. Even though we learned earlier that get is a synonym for kidnap, you actually want to just get here, and you will get a random amount of medicine, which you can then go through and distribute to your party members however you like. Unfortunately, I wasn't paying attention, so I don't know who is most in need of healing, so I'm just going to distribute relatively evenly here. Two, three, four. Oh, it tells me there, so that's somewhat helpful. I don't even remember what their maximums are, but... Let me think. I have 14 minus 4, so I have 10 units left. So I will distribute the extra 2 units to 2 and 3 who are at their lowest. Then the remaining 4 will just distribute evenly. Is there more? Okay, we'll give that to Jirosaku. I must be completely miscounting this up because I thought we were out now. There it is, there was one more round of four. So, where does that leave our HP now? Pretty good. Now let's see if I can find my way out of the forest. Not without another random encounter. Uh, you do see there the red-shirted bandits who appear in the wilderness. They are, as I said, different from the scripted encounter ones. These bandits have 10 power, 15 speed, 60% uh, hit rate, and 50 HP. So they'll take a little longer to wear down than the other ones, but... At least there are only two of them. And after all that EXP we gained from the bandit hideout, hopefully we have a bit more effectiveness in combat, maybe. And as I noted, I'm going to have uh, number three, Tarosaku, stand off to the side for now because he currently has the highest XP apart from Gombe. One day we'll hit it for more than 
4 damage. Thank you. Alright, I'm going to glance at my map briefly here. Uh, there are maps of the game on the CRPG Addicts blog post, which are what I'm referencing when I need to. Let's see, I'm in an oak forest, which is where I want to be. Good, I forgot what type of forest it was. There is a line of identical oak forest squares that go along the north side of the forest, basically, that are probably your most reliable landmark, as far as I can tell. So, when you get into an oak forest, I think what you want to do if you want to get out of the forest is keep trying to go and get focus on the right window. Keep trying to go north. If you're not able to go north, go east. And eventually you will end up at the easternmost oak forest, which, going north from there, will take you back to the lake and eventually back to the castle. So that is, as far as I can tell, the best way to find your way out of the forest if you end up there. If you go further east from that last oak forest, you would get lost, and Goddess only knows where you would end up, so don't do that. Be careful to keep poking the branches to the north every time you move. Check my EXP again real quick. Okay, Gombe is doing great now. I'm not going to worry too much. Just to point it out, if I try to go back into the castle, the king yells at me for not having killed all the bandits yet. Which, if you hadn't gotten that hint from the mountain monk earlier, you would come back here thinking that you'd killed everyone in the bandit hideout, but the king's still mad at you. Okay, so I am going to go back to the town the way I did before, because we are trying to find the last bandits in the town. So again, west, west, north, north takes you to the tea house. West, west, north, north again takes you to the town. I was also going to check my food, and I am indeed nearly out of food, which I want to address. Also, number two needs a new weapon. I should take care of that. So, lots of stuff to do in the town. Hopefully I can make it to the food shop before I die of starvation or any such silly thing. So, from the town entrance, I go south once. There's the pickpocket me message, by the way. I then go west once and then north once. That puts me at the central plaza, where the food store lock is, which I believe I mentioned before. Please give me lots and lots of food so I don't die. Thank you. So that should be plenty of, gold, of food to last for the remainder of the game. Now, let me see, what is the most efficient way to get to the weapon shop from here? As I said, the central area of the town is really horribly mazy. Okay, I think what I want to do is I just go uh, east. That will take me back to that intersection, whatever street name that is. East second shape, according to the map. East second shape royal, whatever. By the way, all the street names were originally in English like that. I did not translate the street names. So if they seem confusing or random, they, that is the fault of the original developers, not me. So again, we go back to this far east side of town. And then, as I did before, we'll get to the town entrance, go all the way north from there. Lots of pickpockets today. West once. That should take us to Lucky East 2nd, where the weapon shop is. Just to make sure I haven't lost any more, so, yes. Buy a longsword for number two. Hooray! Now, the other point of interest in town that I haven't shown yet is the pub. So, to get there from the weapon shop... 
want to go west once. That should put me at Lucky West Second is where I want to be, yes. And then I go straight south until I can't go south anymore. Yep, that puts me here. Uh, if you don't search when you enter this square, there would be a trap when you try to go into the pub. But if we play properly, if we're searching in every square to, to look out for pickpockets, we would catch that trap before we even have to think about it. But as noted, this is where pub Koei is here. How very creative game. So, having disarmed that trap, we want to go into the pub. It's a apparently really terrible pub. You can buy stuff here. I don't know why you'd want to. If you buy milk, they laugh at you. If you buy beer, they don't laugh at you. Either way, as far as I know, it doesn't do anything at all. The CRPG addict claims that he tried to keep buying alcohol and get drunk, which apparently didn't work. I'm not going to bother. What you actually want to do is search, as always. You will see this random person happens to be leaving. What you are supposed to do is leave after him. You'll see him lurking suspiciously behind the door. Contrary to what you might think, you are not supposed to search or talk or get or anything. Can't get, can you? I wonder if Hurry would do anything at all during that encounter, but probably not. What you're actually supposed to do is just try to attack him. He will beg you not to kill him and tell you East Side Shape, the name of one of the streets in the town. To get to East Side Shape from the pub, you just go... All the way east and north once. One last pickpocket. And that takes you to east side shape here. So, basically, what that person was telling you is the location of the bandit safe house to, in exchange for his life. If you try to enter, of course, you just run into the door, even though nothing tells you that there's a door there. But you have to actually attack in order to break down the door, and then you're able to enter and trigger the other scripted encounter with the bandits. Now, as far as I know, the purple-shirted bandits here are identical to the hideout over on the mountain, so nothing too much to worry about there. The bandit leader there, you can see, who looks oddly like Mario, is different. He has 50 power, uh, 50 speed, 70% uh, hit chance, and 50 HP. He's a little tougher, but I guess not by too much at my levels. I think Gombe is far enough ahead at this point that I'm not going to prioritize him too much beyond what's natural. Other than that, I think I want to keep him out of combat with the leader for now. Because the chances of him hitting the leader are just less, I believe. I do want to prioritize him dealing damage whenever I can. Goes Jirasaku. What I'm going to try to do, I think, is have the other two keep the leader occupied, try to wear him down a bit, while Gombe mops up the mooks. Hopefully that will not fail too badly. It does occur to me, I think, that three and four are the least effective in combat, but so they're probably not going to accomplish much over there beyond get themselves killed. But happily, the enemies are just as terrible at hitting us as we are at hitting them. I don't know why this one particular bandit is taking so long to damage. biggest danger really is not just being in melee with enemies, it's just whether or not they happen to get a particularly lucky hit on you. I don't believe the game's mechanics have any concept of a critical hit, but the 
sheer randomness of the damage sure makes it feel like they do. Finally. Now can we actually hit the leader? There we go. Happily, Gombe got a pretty good hit to maintain his EXP lead. Yeah, he's well in the lead here. Okay, so the Bandit Safe House has a slightly unusual mechanic where if you look, you can set what direction you happen to be focusing on at the moment. So, you look to the north, you see a book. Can't search it, but you can read it. But it's not a great novel. I wonder what it could be in a bandit safe house. So you look to the east, you see a desk, and search it and find a note. The note tells you that the treasure is 2000k. I really don't know why they try to tell you that, because the treasure is literally right here. You look to the south, and you see a collapsed bandit. You search that bandit, and you get a bunch of treasure items that total up to 2,000k. So I don't know why they bother writing a note to you to that effect, but... It does let you know that if you search here, you are getting treasure totaling 2,000k. And depending on how the game calculates this, I may find myself a little short on treasure from what the king wants. I really don't know how that mechanic works, so we'll find out today. That is all I can do in the bandit safe house. I've now cleared out all the bandits. I just go north one step. I'm at the town entrance again. Avoid one last pickpocket. And we're done with the town. I'm just going to head back to the castle now. Same way I came. South, south, east, east. South, south, east, east. Hooray! And when we enter the castle... Because we killed a bunch of bandits and got some treasure, we are awarded with... a woman. That's great, game. I'm gonna suggest, by the way, as a supplement to the Bechdel... Bechdel... Bechdel test that... If you have a female character and... That character can be replaced by a cookie and not have it make any meaningful difference to the plot. That's probably not a strong female character, and you might want to rethink that character's role in your plot. Just a suggestion. Anyway, the reason why I have been focusing so much on the lead character's EXP is that at this point the character who gets to marry the princess is the one who has the highest EXP. If one of the characters other than character 1 has the, has the highest total, you get a message saying that, that character married the princess instead, and you get a game over. Because as we all know, when you fail to be married, that's game over. Or was it the other way around? I forget. But again, get apparently means marry, or possibly have sex with, or whatever. That's how you advance. It's not too intuitive. You have to get the princess. And you get the next quest in the game, which is to go save the princess. Again, basically a cookie. So, what the game happens to do now is... All the characters other than your lead character are removed from the party anyway. And as far as the game is concerned, they're effectively dead. So this last bit of the game is indeed a solo adventure which is another reason to make sure that you have adequate EXP for your lead character. The game won't let you go back into the castle after leaving, because obviously it would be humiliating to return without your wife, so you can't do that. Mainly, I think, because the programmers didn't want to script the events differently for that case. But anyway, we should know the way by now. Go 
West, west, north, north. West, west, north, north. Through the town. We go west once more into the hills. South through the plateau. See if we get any random encounters. Happily, the game's taking it pretty easy on us today. I think it has some kind of encounter difficulty scaling, where depending on how much EXP you have, the more encounters you'll get and the harder the encounters become, but I'm not totally sure on that. I had a previous test run where I ended up with a lot of EXP for the lead character from a lot of early game encounters, and I was getting hammered with random encounters the whole way through there, but apparently not today. Uh, anyway, once we get to the mountain road here, there's this other event that happens where we run into a random young girl who invites us into our house. I'm going to do a quick save state here. As we know, the command to accept a random woman's sexual advances is get. Oh, that's a bug. I thought I fixed that. Anyway... The game complains that you're trying to spend time with this random woman when you're supposed to be going to rescue your cookie, I mean wife, from a dragon, and you take a bit of damage, which seems a bit silly. Less well telegraphed is the fact that you do lose 200 EXP for doing that, which isn't the biggest deal, but you don't really want it. I think it might affect the game's evaluation of your, of your performance at the end, too, so... We're not going to do that. Let's reload our save. What you can do instead is attack the girl, which seems a little bit aggressive, but you can do it. Uh, if you try to fight her, she has 30 power, 60 speed, 80% hit chance, and 60 HP, which is surprisingly powerful for a random girl in a hut. Nothing actually happens if you kill her besides she goes away. You might lose the XP for it, I'm not sure. I'm not going to bother actually killing her, though. Let's just continue on our way. Now, we do want to go back to the mountain hut again. Talk to our hermit friend. And we are now told that the dragon lives here and we should take the sword. Interestingly, the trigger for this is just having more than 500 EXP for your lead character, which I believe you could pick it up before you go back and marry the princess. Uh, there's really no... Well, there's a point to doing it, because you would have a magic sword early, but... It would confuse the intended flow of events a little bit, so I didn't try to do so. But now we can get the sword. And now the hut is empty. It doesn't really get mentioned, but I guess the monk disappears too, because he was magic as well. When you have the sword, it's an additional doubling of your combat power beyond just a long sword. So, now that we have that, let's go see if we can find that dragon. From the hut, uh, you can go either west or south, I think. They both take you to Mount Lufay, where there would have been nothing earlier. But if you search now, you end up in combat with the dragon. So the dragon, final boss of the game, as you might expect, it is one of the tougher enemies besides the ones that you're not actually supposed to fight. The dragon has 30 power, uh, 80 speed, 110 hit percentage, and 100 hit points. Its power seems surprisingly low for what it is, but the reason why it has so little power is that it actually has a special attack it can use randomly, which is breathing fire on you. If it does breathe fire, it is just a flat 20 damage, which is pretty bad. What is Gombe's HP right now? Okay, good. He can take one fire breath. Hopefully that will be enough. But because that is not reduced at all by your speed or anything, you can get killed pretty quickly by the dragon's fire breath. Okay, good. I wanted the dragon to move up so I can get one attack before it starts attacking me. Not that it helps. Yeah, there it is. That's the dragon's fire. Hopefully that doesn't happen too much, because this... Ugh. Well, there's the game over screen.
I have absolutely no idea why the game says every time you die that you were entranced by a witch. I'm pretty sure that's an accurate translation of the original text, and that text does show up every time you die, as far as I can tell, in the original game too, so I don't think it's a bug in the translation. As far as I can tell from the game's code, that message shows up any time the lead character has negative EXP. But any time a character dies, their EXP gets reset to minus one anyway, so there is no way you can die without that happening as far as I know. I kind of wonder if maybe that random girl in the hut who you lose EXP for dallying with actually was intended to be the witch they're referring to. And somehow this message is intended to refer to losing EXP from that encounter, I don't know, but I think it is just straight up bugged right now in this version of the game. Anyway, let's try that again from my save state. One other thing I wanted to point out is that if you really want to, you can pick a fight with this monk. And or hermit. But he is actually really powerful. Just like those knights we fought in the castle, he is nearly identical to them, except with fewer HP. He has uh, 75 power, uh, 80 speed, 150 HP, and 100 HP. You can kill him, and he is just gone, but then you don't get the magic sword. So there is no reason to fight him. So I am not going to. So let's try the dragon fight once more. Another thing I've been meaning to point out, but I keep forgetting, is if you attack trees, you can cut them down. I don't know why. I don't think there's ever really any strategic value to that in, wild in the wilderness. But it's there. Okay, once again, let the dragon come to me, try to hit it. Without, without fire breath, that was a lot of damage. Yeah. Okay, maybe I want to actually go grind, which at least will give me some opportunity to show off some of the other wilderness encounters I haven't seen yet. Just to point out, in the process of my grinding, I did run into the medicine girl again, and obviously gave all the medicine I got from her to my only character. I'm pretty sure that's way more HP than he had at the beginning of the game. I don't know if HP is uncapped and you can heal people indefinitely with medicine, or if there's actually a hidden maximum. I really don't know, but that is one thing that will benefit me against the dragon. I do want to show off some of those other encounters, though, so I'm going to keep grinding for a little bit, though I probably could take the dragon just with that dramatically better HP total. Okay, here's another enemy I haven't shown off yet. This is a monster, obviously. It has 50 power, uh, 20 speed, 70% hit chance, and 70 HP. They are actually the strongest of the wilderness encounters. It is perfectly possible to run into one at the beginning of the game, at which point there's a pretty good chance it will just slaughter you. You may be saved just by the sheer randomness of combat. In this case, however, because I have so much EXP for my lead character at this point, there are four of them. But happily, with all my leveling and with the extra power from that magic sword, I'm able to get through them pretty quickly. Okay, there is just one more, mo one more enemy, not a monster, that I am hoping I can encounter before... I go finish up with the dragon, so I'm just going to try that after I get even more medicine. Okay, his HP does max out at 80, so there we go. Probably goes without saying, by the way, but you can't use medicine to revive a dead character. There is no way to revive a dead character. 
Okay, I don't think I'm going to run into the other enemy anytime soon, and I don't want to get too ridiculously over any more ridiculously overleveled than I already am, so I'm going to cut off my wandering around and grinding at this point. So I'm just going to awkwardly splice the sprite of the other enemy into this combat with a bunch more monsters. Uh, this is a grizzly bear. Rawr! Uh, it has 30 power, uh, 7 speed, 50% uh, hit chance, and 60 HP. It is also a pretty dangerous enemy to run into early in the game because it has a lot of power and a lot of HP. I guess because of its speed, it's also relatively easy to hit, as insofar as anything in this game is easy to hit. But either a grizzly bear or a monster can easily wipe out a good portion of your party's resources if you run into them early in the game. I would say if that happens, you should run away, but there is no way, as far as I can tell, to run from combat in this game. I was very lucky in this run that my first couple of random encounters that I hit were just snakes and spiders, which are actually the easiest encounters and the way the difficulty curve ought to work. This was before you could tell how far away from the starting castle you were by the difficulty of the monsters. Anyway, this is where I ended up with kind of ridiculous stats. So, hopefully that's enough for that dragon. Let's go take care of it. Ignoring the witch girl person still standing by her door, hopefully. Because sadly, polyamory does not exist in the world of dragon and princess. Or maybe it does after you beat the game. We'll have to see. First and foremost, we have to rescue our wife from the dragon. Or our cookie, whichever she is. Okay, that's a convenient place for it to spawn. So, bam. That was a really good hit to start out with. Yeah, with those stats, the dragon encounter was just ridiculously easy. So, anyway, defeating the dragon, we just get this victory screen without a whole lot of interest to it beyond that. Uh, I'll try and research what the things that contribute to your score is later on. I haven't looked at it in precise detail yet, but I think basically if you do everything you're supposed to do in the game and don't sleep with random women on the way to rescuing your wife and whatever, you'll get the maximum scripted score. I believe you can also increase your score indefinitely beyond that by some ratio of your lead character's EXP. So I guess if you really wanted to, you could play the game forever and try and actually get the highest score on the internet, but why? I am not going to be attempting it again. So that's Dragon and Princess. There's really not much to it. Uh, it is up to your judgment how much, if at all, it seems to represent any kind of uniquely Japanese approach to RPG design. I really don't know. It did have a fairly interesting collection of one-off encounters. Even though each of them was just a one-off encounter, there were a lot of mechanics that were only in the game for exactly one use. But, and I do think combat requires enough thought and strategy to be minimally engaging. It would certainly get tiresome after a long game, but this is a pretty short game anyway. I think if you're just trying to figure out where to go and how to maximize your score, it would have had a fair amount of replayability at the time. But beyond that, I don't think there's really much more to say about it. Thank you for watching, and good night.